Before we get started, I just want to say that while we aim to make our episodes about 30 to 40 minutes long, we felt that today's conversation is worth hearing in full. We hope you're blessed as you listen in on our conversation with Jean. Welcome to the Overflow Podcast. This is a podcast on a mission to discover how you and I can live a life of abundance, full to overflowing. In this first season, we've been unpacking biblical principles on gifts like love, grace, and forgiveness, and how we can better receive them and pass them on to others. This is our final episode of the season, episode number nine. My name is Carl Lindsay, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Philip Milosavljevich. How's it going, Philip? Hey, Carl. I can't believe we've gotten to the end. This is I am a little bit sad. Yeah, but it's coming back. Season three is just a few, or season two, I should say, is just a few weeks away. Um, it's looking forward to that one too. So now, Carl, tell me, uh, what has been the most uh, strange and exciting thing that you've done in the last uh, couple weeks? Um, nothing. I know I love throwing you off. Yeah, <laughs> you do love throwing me off. I, I don't know. I, I walked those 22 miles, as I told you about. But that's really it. I haven't done much, too much else. Had a bonfire. Spring is here. I will say that. The weather is getting warmer. So it's nice uh, to be able to get outside that, a little more. That's in Australia. That's in Australia. For those of you listening, it's it's blazing hot here in California. Yeah. You're not in Literally danger of those blazing. fires, right? Man, we had the fires probably a good five, six miles from us, and then they kind of kept moving. But, man, they've been burning so much of California. Wow. It's, it's, it's unfortunate, but I understand that's how nature has to work. But it was so interesting. I didn't realize this, but hundreds of lightning bolts, bolts struck down in Northern California, causing many of the fires. That's what I heard. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping that we don't have the same kind of system. The world heard about their Australian wildfires last year, but mm. we're coming into season, I guess, starting today, the day we're recording this, and so hoping hoping that doesn't happen all over again. Yeah, yeah. It feels almost apocalyptic. We had huge fires in California and then two hurricanes that converged into one on the East Coast. I was just like... Lord, this is something else. Pestilence, fire, earthquake, uh, hurricane. I mean, man. 2020 has been a year to remember. Quite the year, yeah. Yeah. So as we mentioned, uh, we'll be back in a few weeks' time with season two in October. Uh, Well, Broken Love and Redeeming Grace is the title for the next season. We've got a four-part mini-series lined up on each of those topics. Uh, some special guests that are going to help us dig deeper into some of those themes. Uh, themes actually that we've touched on in this first season, but I'm looking forward to having conversations that go deeper and learning uh, more about how we can kind of navigate the brokenness and find path to redemption. Mm, so that should be really be good. good. That's going to be really exciting. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Also want to shout out, uh, give Zach Cast a shout out. On He's been our tech guru guy from the Loma Linda University Church helping out with Philip on his end. Uh, so thanks to Zach and the church there. It's been Woo-hoo. good. Zach, you want to say anything over there? He's staring at me, shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, So, but to end out the season, we thought we'd get another special guest on the show Uh because we all have our own stories that are made up of micro stories, the ups and downs that shape our lives and the people w- who we are today. Uh, so today we get the opportunity to introduce you to Jean Gersbach. Uh, she has a powerful story to share with us about how she has seen God's gifts of love, grace and forgiveness all intertwine in her life, especially as it relates to one of her life defining micro stories from about 17 years ago. Uh, she's the mother of two daughters She's a past missionary. She teaches nurses how to be nurses. And I'll say this, she also lives just a few minutes walk from a beautiful Australian beach. So for all you people out there, that's something to be envious of. I'm jelly about that one. (laughs) Yeah, welcome, Jean. Thank you. Yes. Glad to have you. We live in a beautiful place. Now, before the show, Jean, you said that you also were 
at a refugee camp in Cambodia on the border before you got married. That's correct, yes. And now what ha- what happened there? You were saying something about um, just the work that was going on. Why were you there and, and what was going on at the time? So this was back in the 80s and the early 80s when um, under the Pol Pot regime and there were literally hundreds and thousands of refugees coming over into Thailand mm. um, to escape the brutality. Um, so I worked in probably three different areas but one of those um, places that I worked was in um, uh, Kamput and that was uh, a refugee camp, but quite a large camp but our, uh, under the auspices of ADRA uh, which um, was then known as SOURCE, um, we had a, a surgical ward where we catered for uh, people who had come in from the bush who had been who'd trodden on landmines and usually came in with gangrene in their limb. It often took a couple of days to get to us and wow. every patient on our ward, there was probably 22, 23 at any given time, had had an amputation mm. of at least one of their legs. Mm. Mm. You have had quite the life of experiences. Yeah, it was an amazing experience. We had a lot of fun as well, um, getting to and from the camp, for example. Um, there Across were the river, muddy, right? yeah, there were rivers, but there was also muddy, very, very muddy roads. For some mm. reason, over there, they used to do the roadworks in the middle of the wet season, <laughs> so it was not <laughs> unusual for us to get bogged. And I remember one particular time we were so heavily bogged, we had to, they had to get in an elephant to actually pull the truck, pull our car oh. out. So there you go. We, that doesn't happen here in Australia. No, <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So you've had a bit of a. Missionary experience, and you said that was the 80s. Were you there as a student missionary type? Uh, no, it was a voluntary position. Voluntary position. Um, I just was in church one day and I heard that the, someone presented, I think it was a doctor from memory, and she just presented her experience while she'd been um, working as a doctor there and that they needed nurses, and immediately I thought, I've got to go, I okay. just want to go. It was this, just sort of almost a compulsion. So yeah. I was fortunate to be able to get leave of absence from my job, my work, and um, went for three months and then I went back later for another three-month stint. Okay. Mm. So you did, uh, you had that experience and then throughout the next few years after getting married, you also went to Papua New Guinea at some point in the 90s, Yeah, I think you said. So, yeah, take us, take us back all those years and at, after that experience you came back to Australia, you had a young family, uh, you were living and working here. Talk about your faith journey at that point and before you and your husband, Lance, you accepted a mission, uh, a call to the mission field again. Uh, tell us about that little that journey of faith there. Look, at that time, things, particularly back in Australia, it's very easy. When you're in a, in a, um, a difficult, like when I was in Thailand, you know, and you're faced with the, the reality, the raw reality of what life is for some people, um, it's, I think... It's e- if it was easier to be more reliant on God and when we came back into Australia and things were going reasonably well um, and I certainly had a relationship with God. Um, however, certainly for me, I think when life is going well, it's easy just to to cruise if you like and, and mm-hmm. in, in some ways, I mean, I was go- we were going to church and as I said, I had a relationship with God. I was doing the Christian thing and... But almost, I don't know whether this is an American term, but it's sort of the doing church. I was doing church. I was going. I was involved, involved in the kids' Sabbath schools and whatever. whatever. But my personal faith journey was not really vibrant, not really, um, yeah, it wasn't, it was It was probably a bit dull. Not like it had been in those times when you were overseas? No, it wasn't because I think I, I knew that I, need, I needed, I, I sensed I needed God all the time, but I was more aware of my need of God. And I think mm. what I've learned through this, you know, the, the uh, experience with Lance in uh, Malaysia, that when troubles happen, then, my goodness, when real big troubles happen, that's when God is essential. Mm. Yeah. We talked last week, there was this, this quote from an, a Greek poet who talks about the idea that we don't actually rise to the challenge, we fall back on our training. Mm-hmm. And so you're saying that the training can be like the 
that relationship with God in the in the good times because when the trouble strikes then you're going to fall back on that training rather than all of a sudden develop a, a close mm. relationship with God. Mm. Yeah, falling back on the training and perhaps even more um, coming to the realisation that, you know what, I need God all the time. Mm-hmm. I've become casual, I've been co- become complacent, but I really realise now I can't, do, I can't do life really without him. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Mm. I'm reminded of the reality that when you get married, <clears throat> you sometimes bring in your default family experience into your marriage. So if you saw your parents arguing in a certain way about certain things, sometimes you'll you'll fall into that because you learned that early on. And so if you can build a strong default spiritually, mm. when you hit those difficult trying spaces, potentially that might be uh, a strong deterrent against falling into ruts that some people who've never walked with Christ or built strong foundations to live into an overflow way of life, um, you you might be potentially better off. I don't know. What do you think about that, Jean? Is that? Um, yeah, I think there's. I I think that there's certainly a lot of a lot of truth in that. I think um, with with all of life, I think all of life's experience is valuable, and if we are open to learning, and you know, learning from the different experiences, be that in a marriage relationship um, or any relationship, I think. Uh, yeah, I think that those um, seeds that have been sown have the opportunity to really grow mm. in the in the, mm. in the in all times, but particularly the difficult ones. Yeah. So mm. you had that moment, that time when you were in Malaita, you just mentioned uh, you went from uh, Australia with Lance and your family in 2003. Yep. Uh, where is Malaita? Tell us that and tell us about those first few months and the the main event on May 18. Okay, so Malaysia is in uh, one of the islands of the Solomon Islands, which is in the South Pacific, uh, in the Pacific Ocean rather. It's up near the equator, so the climate is extremely hot Mm. all the time and very, very humid all the time. Um, We were asked to go. Lance was to take over the role of business manager and my role primarily was to homeschool the girls and I did voluntary work in the School of Nursing. Okay. The first few months there were... Um, were great. They were uneventful, very, very busy, but we had a very peaceful life. Uh, My children were the only white children um, there, but they became friends very quickly with the local Mm. children on the campus predominantly. Um, We took, I took quite a few books over, children's books with us and um, the local children, of course, didn't have access to that. So I said to them, to them, look, we'll have this little library and if ever you want a book, you can come and get it and we, and then if you want a second book, you have to bring the first one back. Mm. And that worked really well. So we always have had children knocking on our door mm. um, <laughs> uh, wanting another book. Yeah. And, yeah, that worked really well. The, my girls would do their homeschooling in the morning and they would play with the local children all afternoon. Uh, and it was really a very happy and peaceful existence. Mm. Very busy. Lance was very, very busy, but uh, he was highly respected. Lance was a sort of person who um, he he would always get involved. He never expected those under him to do something he wasn't willing to do himself. Mm. Um, so if they're doing digging trenches, he'd be out digging trenches with them. Oh. Um, yeah. So yeah, our life was went went along very very well. And then of course came May May eighteen in two thousand and three and. <clears throat> the day started out very normally. I remember uh, Lance just took my hand in bed. It was around 6 a.m. And we just chatted about the different activities that we had planned for the day. And uh, he always had, didn't matter, it was a Sunday and it doesn't didn't matter that it was a Sunday. He always had things that he was doing. Uh, and, yeah, that was fine. And it came about lunchtime and I was just getting a bit of lunch in the kitchen and uh, the girls were playing and um, Lance came in and he said to me, oh, some of the maintenance men are going down to build a trench or to dig a trench rather. And he said, I want to give them a hand so I won't have lunch with you. I'll catch up with you later. And again, that was nothing unusual. So we sat down, had our lunch and it was about maybe an hour and a half, two hours later uh, when somebody came running up our front stairs and um 
I took one look at his face and I, I knew something was terribly wrong. Mm. And, uh, yeah, when he was able to compose himself, um, he said to me, Jean, he said, uh, something terrible has happened. He said, Lance has been murdered, mm. Mm. brutally murdered. He's been beheaded. And um, I was, I, I, I don't know actually, I have no idea what I said. I, I was speechless. I was just mm. s- totally stunned. Yeah, totally stunned. And, um, of course, the girls came running in and they wanted to know what was happening. So I had to tell them that Daddy had been killed. And uh, Adawifi is very, very isolated. So there's no roads. There were no telephones. Mm. Uh, we couldn't contact family. Wow. Um yeah, so it was a matter of trying to think. Um, I guess I went into automatic mode thinking, okay, how well, how are we going to deal with this? And so I said to the girls, we will stay here at Atawifi until Tuesday because I knew there was no flights back to Australia until yeah. the Tuesday. I said, we will stay here, we'll get a direct flight back um, and we'll go back to Australia. So it was going to be two days later? Two days later. Yeah. And the reason for saying that was I thought, a, there's no, was no way to get back to Honiara anyway. Mm. And um, I thought at least we know people here in Atawifi um, and I knew that they would care for us and then um, we would get a direct flight back to Australia because I yeah. knew nobody in Honiara. Yes, yeah, so that was my plan. Well, about two hours later, um, two aircraft landed on the rocky airstrip and it's a very rocky airstrip. Um, Flights could only come in during the daytime because there's no lights or anything. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, oh, that's weird, that's really unusual. And I was still obviously trying to, you know, comfort the girls and they were very, very afraid. Mm. Anyway, it wasn't long before our home was filled with uh, people, officials from the High Commission, Australian High Commission in Honiara. So news must have been radioed back? It was radioed back and there is a radio at the hospital um, that I didn't have access to. Um, yes, so they came in and after brief introductions, they just informed me that, Jean, they said, we're here to evacuate you back to Honiara. Uh, we need to leave immediately. You have 10 minutes to get wow. ready. Mm. That's so fast. Oh, wow. Yes. So, yeah, how did that, I guess the, you were planning for be, to be a couple of days. So it was, it was going to be just... 10 minutes, like why didn't they give you half an hour? Is that, why was it so soon? The reason for that was because it was getting near sundown and the aircraft okay. could not take off. Yeah. As soon as it started to get dark, they couldn't take off. And yeah. that was the timing. Yeah, yeah, it was a pure timing thing. Okay. Wow. I'm I'm just, uh, there are so many questions I have, Gene, and I I don't know how I would have been able to process that news that my spouse had just been murdered in front of me and what were what were you thinking what were you feeling in that moment in that space look i think look really we were i, I was in just a state of absolute shock to be honest mm. it was yeah uh, um all I could think of was ha- how am I going to, you know, deal with this in the moment? How am I going to get back to a place where the girls and I are safe? Um, and I hadn't, at that point, I, I, I remember one of my daughters asking me, you know, what's going to happen to the man who killed him? Mm. And mm. Um, and I just said, oh, look, I don't know and I really don't care, you know, it, who cares? I mean, yeah. you know, it, it wasn't an issue at that point. It became an issue later. But, um, yes, it, everything happened so quickly. Um, that actually was very traumatic in the time because yeah. just leaving everything, you had no time to sort of process what was happening, no time to say goodbye to anyone. Um, I mean, our house was filled with people but... Yeah, we were all in a state of shock. I, yeah. I wanted to see Lance and they wouldn't, I wasn't allowed. So, um, yeah, it was a very difficult time. Mm, for sure. So then you went back to Honiara um, and came back to Australia still in that same week or what was the next process? Yes, yeah, so we went back to Honiara and um, we flew back to Australia on the Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Man. Wow. Now, Jean, did you ever understand what and why that happened? That that um, that's kind of 
Yeah. Well, I didn't. I knew nothing. I had no idea of why it had happened. We knew that Lance was uh, respected. We knew that he was very much appreciated. Um, it really wasn't until um, I spoke with um, the Coyo Council of Chiefs, uh, and that wasn't till f- four years later, that he gave me um, a little bit of insight and he said he believed that it was a random attack. There were other stories going around that um, something had gone on at the hospital between um, someone was supposed to have paid some money okay. and they weren't, it wasn't enough money and it, it, Lance knew nothing of this um, but it, was, it had nothing to do with Lance but somebody had to have payback. So there was a payback mentality mentality yeah. but look to be honest to answer your question why did it happen i personally am not convinced that anybody knows i choose to accept the um Coyo council of chief story that he said it really was a random, random yeah mm. a random attack wow. mm. so wow. there were two men that were accused that's correct um yeah. how how long later did you you went back there to the trial mm mm-hmm. mhm yeah, how was that process of the court case? Okay, so the court case was held about 10 months after the mm-hmm. murder and I flew back for that trial. And I remember um, at that stage, you know, I had certainly uh, by that stage I'd moved past that I don't care who did this. I mm-hmm. really was wanting justice. Yeah. And uh, I remember sitting in that makeshift courtroom uh, on Malaita and I looked into the eyes of the two men who had uh, murdered Lance. Mm. And then video footage was shown um, to the court of Lance's body and uh, it was really, it was really horrific. Um, Absolutely. It was, yeah, it was, it was just so awful. And I remember looking into their eyes and I just felt so much hatred. I felt angry. I felt mm. hatred and I just despised them and I wanted them to know that I despised them. So it wasn't just an internal anger. It was something I wanted them to see. And in the midst of that intense anger, um, this Bible text flashed into my mind, don't insist on getting even, don't mm. seek revenge, it is mine to avenge. And I thought, that's ridiculous, that's incongruous, uh, you know. Mm. And yet the message was really clear. Don't don't seek revenge. Uh, Revenge is mine, says the Lord. And, um, you know, being honest, I was really afraid to let go of those feelings of anger because somehow I felt that if I just held on to them, uh, those who had hurt us were more likely to be punished. Wow. Yeah, but that didn't happen. No. So wow. apparently the, the these guys got acquitted? Yes. Yeah, so um, we had, you know, I won't go into a lot of detail, but basically there was very little cooperation from the local people and that, that's because of the implications for yeah. them. Um, so the devil priest was supposed to have come, he didn't. Anyway, both men were acquitted, a subsequent appeal was dismissed and uh, double jeopardy was then applied and so the case remains unsolved to this day. Wow. Mm. Oh, my. Now, Mm. Jean, if I could backtrack just for a moment, was that the first time you had seen Lance? Yes, that was the first time. That must have been an awful moment to be in that courtroom and seeing that video. Yeah, it was. It was incredibly traumatic because it was it was just so horrendous, so horrendous. And mm. um, those sort of things don't leave you. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And now when you when you saw those two men, you said potentially that holding on to the anger felt as though some form of punishment could be given them. Yeah, I just thought if, I don't know, it was this feeling that if I could just hold on to that anger, then maybe, maybe that they would get punished. But, of mm. course, you know, that didn't happen for them and it certainly only made things worse for me. But but in the moment, that's how it was. Wow. Yeah. Wow. What did it, what did that anger do to you exactly? What did you feel like happened to you through I think, that, those yeah. months and time? I think uh, just holding on to I I had this absolutely compelling um, desire to find justice. I wanted, 
I felt, you know, God places enormous value on human life and he does. And I yeah. thought these men need to be punished. This needs to, you yeah. know, you cannot do this sort of thing um, and not be punished. And so I then probably turned a lot of my energy into seeking how can we find justice. And so I really became consumed with that. Mm. You know, look, I was obviously um, at that, that time the girls were back at school and I was trying to be a, a good mum and they they don't agree with me that I wasn't present, but I knew myself that my mind was often um, elsewhere and yeah. um, so I wasn't always emotionally present. For, you know, I talk to them now and they say they they never felt that, but I knew whether they felt it or not it was that was the case, yeah. that I was, mm. yeah, preoccupied with um, I just I wanted justice. So how, how was it for me? It was a really difficult time. It was mm. a, um, yeah, at a time where I just felt it was exhausting, it's stressful. Um, yeah. And I just, yeah. Yeah, my energy was being spent ruminating, I guess, on what had happened. Yeah. 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 Mm. I know that many people who are Christians feel enormous guilt at times for even talking about seeking justice on in this life but i i think there is a place for that and um i th i think that's that's why we do have laws in place otherwise that would there wouldn't be a need for them because it's just well just just live by grace and one day it'll get figured out but i i think when i think look at romans and what paul says hey god uses government rules, law, and order, I think the unfortunate thing in your story is that that didn't work. Mm, yeah, oh, absolutely. And, and uh, yes, I don't for a minute think, yeah, I definitely don't believe we should just let things off. off. But when, when we take it upon ourselves to become, to that controls us then or when it I, when I took it upon myself and that's what I was investing my energy on um, then it destroyed me I, certainly forgiveness does not mean there should be no consequences it does not mean no. um, that we should continue to let someone abuse us or all, all those things absolutely not we must we live in a society that where laws need to be followed mm. but mm. if yeah it's so the the case was kind of closed at that point, and as you said, still remains closed to this day. Yeah. So in the, in those next few years, what were the questions that you were really wrestling with internally? Mm. Like maybe one or two really questions that kind of kept repeating it over and over in your mind. I guess um, really around that time, probably a bit before, and certainly after, I then had real questions about God. Mm. So, um, as I said before, I had a faith in God, but now I got to a point where I thought, you know what, I don't care what anybody tells me. I don't care what the pastor tells me, the church tells me. My faith has to be real. Yeah. God is either real or this is a big fake. And I've got mm. to find that out for myself. And so I set out on that journey. This is my journey. I will find out. Is he real? Does he really care? Yeah. Um, mm. And that was the journey that I then pursued. Mm. Okay. Wow. Wow. The why questions. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I just think of the reality that you were a mother and you had to also fill in the shoes of being a father, which um, seemingly is, is, is impossible to some degree. But but you had to uh, be strong for your girls. How did that process of quote unquote needing to be strong for them, I guess, affect you? Would you I mean, you you potentially couldn't grieve as as you might because you didn't want to affect them. I mean, how how did that go as you're searching through the answers, searching scripture, looking in this journey to find God, and yet? still bearing the pain of the loss. He's he's not there when you wake up in the morning. He's not there to talk about the troubles of life and parent these girls. How, how did you work through that? I guess right from the start I decided I was going to be 100% honest. Um, I, I never told them 
you know, overtly that about my questions about God, mm-hmm. but I told them that I had questions. Um, and uh, so I was honest with them from the start. I um, did my best, it's everything I could do to um, protect them. Just real quick, how old were the girls at this point? So they were, not, uh, Anita had just turned nine and Louise was 11. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so they, and I won't go into their own personal journeys, but they had, S- yeah, sure. Definite issues, and yeah. and so that was that was very very difficult because they were very afraid, and one of them yeah. was very afraid to even leave leave me at all. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just being honest with them, but all but continuing to say, you know, through this journey we will find God, and we will hopefully find Him in a deeper and more meaningful way. Mm. I said that's what I want to do. Um, we prayed together. Um, Yes, so it was really just being there and trying to be, if they had questions, if they wanted to just stay with me at any time or cry with me. I didn't hide my emotions from them. Um, Mm. So I think, I guess probably that's, I did, there was probably times when I did actually, like at night. (laughs) But, you know, during the day, if I was a bit teary, they, they knew and they'd just come and give me a hug and... So it wasn't oh. as if I tried to put on this happy face. I just uh. was was my normal self, but they didn't see the raw. They've seen more of the raw emotion in latter years probably, mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. So at some point then uh, over the next few years, you were contacted by someone letting them letting you know that there was someone from that island coming to Australia. Tell us about that that, uh, story. Yeah, so up until that point I had had no opportunity to speak to anybody. So Mm. I knew I had no idea really why it had happened um, and I'd spoken to no one. And I had was able to contact an anthropologist and he told me of this impending visit of the chairman of the Coyo Council of Chiefs. um, So he would have been a, for those that don't understand the whole uh, political system on an island like that. He was the one of the powerful men on the island. So he was not so much in the island, but in that particular area where they lived, he was the most powerful man in Bush Coya. So people, the people who lived in the bush, okay. he was uh, in that area where he was the most powerful man, and he had intimate knowledge of the goings on within the community. Yeah. So this was an amazing uh, opportunity, yeah. and so I, I had a couple of hours' notice, and uh, I drove to Sydney, which was a couple of hours to where I had to go, and I was given one hour to spend with him. Mm. So uh, you talked, you mentioned before that you got to talk a little bit about the maybe the why. Mm-hmm. Um, what else was uh, that experience like for you? What else did you talk about there? Yes, yeah, so we just shared shared that you know, he, he shared the story and our experiences of the day, um, and then I said to him, it's been four years, I said, um, I just feel I'm at a block. I feel I am frozen in time in a way. I, I want to be able to move forward, but I can't seem to be able to do that. There's been no justice. Um, I just, I don't know what to do. Mm. And he was looking down at the time. I remember it so clearly. And he hesitated for a moment and then he looked up and looked me in the eye and he said, Jean, he said, you've got two options, but really only one option um, to move forward. It's going to move forward. And I just remember sort of holding my breath thinking, oh, maybe he's got an answer. Yeah. And then he said to me, Jean, you need to come back to Malata, meet with the accused, pray with them and offer your total forgiveness. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That, I'm sure there would have been like, a stunned silence like there is just now. <laughs> like, how did you take that? I was so angry. Wow. Yeah. I was profoundly angry. I could barely speak. Mm. But uh. I knew that I had to, well, I did not want to make a fool of myself probably. <laughs> <laughs> and so I I just thanked him and said, I, I don't know what I said, probably said I'll give it some thought or something, yeah. inane, and uh, and the, the visit came to a close. But really you had no intention of? No, I thought, no, how dare he ask me to forgive after all that has happened. Mm. They're acquitted, they're free anyway, Um, so they don't deserve, I felt they don't deserve my forgiveness. 
Wow. And uh, and then I had an hour and a half drive or two hours it was actually to drive back to my home. And his words just kept going over mm. and over in my mind. And, um, and then slowly it started to make sense. And I thought, you know, he's not asking any more of me than what Jesus has already done on yeah. my behalf. Yeah. You know, wow. Jesus has forgiven me. I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. I did mm-hmm. nothing that was of value, but he offered me that forgiveness. And it was at that point, driving up that freeway, that I thought, this is a way out. This is the answer. I had intellectually forgiven, but I hadn't at an emotional level. And it was just like this suddenly, um, just a way out, I guess. And I just remember the uh, tears were just flowing. I was just crying. Uh, But there was the beginning of a sense of peace. Um, becoming to be, beginning to wash over me. Mm. Mm. Wow. Now, would you say that you found yourself coming to this realization because you wanted freedom, or you felt as though it was the right thing to do biblically, or you almost wanted also to to do something? For these men, in some way, I mean, what what were you what were you thinking? Why? What sort of motivated me? Yeah, you know, I think re- what I believe this my belief is that God, throughout this whole journey, led me. Mm. Um, he led me to a point where I was ready to forgive, not only intellectually but emotionally as well, and so. I didn't do it because I felt I should. I didn't feel do it because I thought it was the right thing. I did it because I believe God placed something in my heart or he gave me the ability to think, you know what, you can forgive. I will enable mm. you to forgive. Uh, and it was just the right thing to do. So yeah. it would have been a something that was going to give you closure like that man had said, it's, it's your way out. Mm. Uh, had any other options for closure crossed your mind at that point? Well, I had tried. I wanted, desperately wanted closure yeah. because, all, you know, so much of my time was spent going over, you know, ruminating and I mm-hmm. had a lot of contact throughout all those years with the uh, High Commission in Honiara and they were keeping me updated with what was happening. So <clears throat> there was no other option uh, for closure. It just no. seemed that it was like I was at a brick wall. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Would Now, would you say that you found that this process of, I guess what you, what I'm hearing from you is you followed almost the Holy Spirit through this journey of bitterness and anger, and it was just the next step as Christ was leading you, not because you were forced, not because other people were telling you, you got to forgive. It was just Time had gone by, Christ had been working, and this was that next beckoning call from him. Mm. Yeah, I guess I learned a lot about God's love in mm. that. I and, and that over the four years, I, I learned firstly that he never gave up on me. Um, God was patient. He He certainly used people to, to bring me hope. But, you know, I think most of all in that journey toward that point, I developed a deeper understanding of the gospel. Mm. Um, I learned that God truly loves and he truly accepts me just as I am. Uh, and God's when, when you come to a realisation that God totally accepts you exactly a, a, as you are, that changes you. And mm. for me it changed my understanding of who God is and I certainly have a a deeper understanding of his love. I know now I can have assurance today that I am saved Um, and I'm saved nothing, not by what I'm doing, but I'm saved on the basis of what Jesus has done on my behalf. So he paid the penalty for my sin. I'm saved by grace alone, through faith alone. And uh, I guess in summary I've learned that I'm accepted. I'm accepted in the Beloved. I'm complete in him and now there is no condemnation. And that is amazing to come to that point and it was that journey 
that has brought that faith. Do I always feel like that? No, I have my days where mm. I feel, you know, discouraged and I think God must, it's time he gave up on me. But deep down that's that's at my core. Yeah. Yeah. Good. You know, I think that our listeners potentially would be wondering, some of them who've done things for God or, or our believers have prayed through tough seasons and they look at your life, hey, you just dedicated your life to be a missionary, to work for Jesus, to go where the gospel would send you, and this happens. How do you reconcile serving Christ and suffering in this sort of a way? Or being a believer or praying and things don't end up the way you would have imagined they should? Mm. Look, I don't know that any of us have an answer. I certainly don't have an answer for that. I still have no idea why God allowed this to happen in terms why did he allow this um, trauma to happen. But I do believe God can work good out of that trauma and mm. I believe he has. Mm. It doesn't take away mm. the pain. It doesn't take away the fact that children didn't have a father, um, all those things. Um, so there, I don't think there are... Well, for me, there is no easy answer to that other than God has promised he will work good through all things, the good, the bad, the ugly. Wow. Yeah. He will, he wow. said, I, you know, in all things, mm. I will work it out for good and if for, to those who, who love and trust him. And mm. uh, so I, that's the, the choice I've made and I think, well, I will choose. I don't know why you've allowed this, but mm-hmm. I will choose to believe that you will work it out for good. And that that actually gives you some, oh, I don't know what, it's not purpose, but it's sort of you can see that if, if by believing that, well, God will work it out for good, even though it's tough along the way. Yeah. Yeah. I want to backtrack a little bit to where you talked about uh, intellectual forgiveness and emotional forgiveness. Mm-hmm. At the time you met the, the chief man, he was encouraging you to forgive really emotionally, you said that you'd kind of already intellectually forgiven. So can you talk about the difference there? And at what point had you intellectually forgiven? Pr- pretty early on. I don't remember exactly when it was. It was. I, th- I think it was probably a bit after the trial. And I think in many ways it was a choice um, that I made thinking, you know, this. I need to do this. Um, I've got to get on with my life. Yeah. I've got to be there for my children. Um, it is. I'm a Christian. It's the thing yeah. that I should do. Um, so it was more a decision, and I wanted to forgive deep down. I thought, no, I've, I've got to forgive, and so it was a choice, purely a choice. But it was very much a choice in my head. It wasn't. My heart was not there, mm. and the evidence my heart was not there yeah. was the fact that I kept pursuing what ways. How can we bring justice to? Yeah. And I I rationalised, well, actually maybe not rationalised, but, you know, I sort of thought, no, you can't just let evil get away. You know, we've got to deal with evil. Mm. Um, and I believe that. I think people should be punished and, and whatever, but um, if it, it was destroying me uh, and there comes a point where you've got to make a choice on that as yeah. well. Yeah. So when you did make that choice, uh, th- that feeling that rushed in, like what was that like and what did... What did you do next? It, it, the intellectual choice or the, the, the emotional one? Yeah, oh, it was amazing. It. Yeah. yeah. So when, when I made that choice, and you know, as I said, driving up the freeway, I was just in tears. I was just uh, there was just peace. Mm. And then when I got home, I thought, um, you know, and I, I talked to the girls a bit about it, and and then I thought, you know, I'm not going to make any rash decision. A, I couldn't go back to Malata. The girls, it was not appropriate for me to leave the girls. Um, and so I ended up writing a letter okay. uh, where I offered my forgiveness. But I I didn't. So this was in September when I met the, um, the chief and I wrote the letter in January, I think it was December, January. So I waited four months mm. and I did that purposely because I thought I don't want to do anything rash that later I will think, why did I do it? <laughs> yeah, mm. so I waited and I was totally ready. I yeah. sent the letter. Um, I sent it to um, the, the, the uh, chief. Okay. Uh, I had heard, I heard back from, because uh, I sent it actually to Ardwifi Hospital, 
and for them to forward it on and he was in hospital at the time. And so I knew it, the letter had re- been received but I never had a response. Mm. Yeah. To this day? Yep. To this day you haven't had a response? I never heard any anything back. And would you say you needed a response, you wanted a response, or or you feel as though the work that needed to be done that God had almost commissioned you to do uh, for your benefit had been done? Look, I guess it, um, I certainly had probably hoped that I would get a response. I didn't know whether I would, but I had hoped that I would. But when I received no response, I thought, you know what, it really doesn't matter. In the end, God has brought me to this point. He's enabled me um, to reach this point where I can emotionally forgive. I've done what I can do. God can deal with the rest. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So we've talked about grace and forgiveness this season mm-hmm. um, and we've discovered they often go hand in hand. So how was grace a part of the process for you? I guess um, coming to a realisation of what God has forgiven me and you see that that grace that he's provided for me and um, so I think that really was the pivotal the pivotal point. When I saw what God had done for me and the fact that he loved me, he cared for me, he accepted me, um, as I said before, I'm accepted in him, there is no condemnation, then I thought, how can I not respond in kind? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm really oh. curious, has this experience made it easier for you to forgive others uh, in the years since? That's a really interesting question. I was just thinking about that in the last couple of weeks. Um, this year I've just had, which I won't go into details, I've had a few challenges this this year with a few different things oh, that have happened. Have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, I got myself really cross about something that had, had happened mm. and, um, you know, and I thought, you know, why are you just being, why are you so caught up and, and so cross about what should have happened and it should have, something should have happened that didn't uh, and yet you've, forgiven someone who's murdered your husband. And I think so to say that now that this has happened and I've forgiven these men for this horrendous crime that life is sweet, well, that's not entirely true. Um, So back to your question, um, I just have to remind myself that sometimes the the small... Uh, smaller things can be harder. <laughs> yeah, they get under your skin. <laughs> yeah, get much. under your skin. But, um, you know, again, God, when we seek him, his um, His grace for ourselves, we can, that that of itself is, is something that you say, well, he's giving, his grace is given to me, it's given to all. Yeah. And I want to respond in kind. I don't always feel like it though. Mm-hmm. You touched on this earlier, uh, this last question here, the the love that God kind of had for you as he just walked with you gently through your pain. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you learn from that kind of love as as it all relates to this, to that journey of walking day by day with him? I th- yeah, I just think that's just so important. You know, I really did get to a point where I just felt God really, God really did love, love me and he understood me. Mm. And, um, you know, I mentioned that as Christians, sometimes we we feel we should be forgiving. I remember someone coming to me, a, a close friend, within it was about three months after the death, and a very well intended friend. And she said to me, Jean, she said, "You just need to forgive, forget, just put it behind you, and move on with your life." And um, I felt so guilty. I felt so bad that I couldn't do that. Yeah. And it it. Um, it was really unhelpful, but for God, I never ever felt that that was what God was saying. I, you know, mm-hmm. I knew that I needed to forgive, but um, you know, there were times I would call out, I would cry to Him in anger, I'd cry to Him in love, I'd cry to Him in despair. That all those emotions, I, it was like He was my go-to, and I would do that. And never once did I have that sense He's over you. He's had enough. Yeah. You know, and I would, and that's the other thing I didn't mention. In that first year um, where I really started to seriously pursue God, 
so many times when I would be reading a passage of scripture or reading a devotional that was on for a particular day, just sitting down reading through this devotional, so many times what I would read was exactly where I was at. Mm. It was so amazing and I'd, I would think, How, mm. this is exactly what I needed today and I would just be in tears reading it. Yeah. And and so for me it was just absolute evidence that God is walk, working walking this journey with you. He's not, not forcing you beyond where you're emotionally mm. ready to go. Just mm. go with it and he will bring he will bring you you know, back together yeah. again. Yeah. Love that because love uh, is all about that self-sacrificing thing. So it's it's you're loving the other person where they're at. Mm. Like God is loving us yeah. where we are. Where we at. are. Yeah. Yeah. And just gently walking. Were there any resources in particular that, that helped you along the way? Books or even techniques or just sermons or ways of processing that helped you um not not really i did i read quite a lot um i did read quite a lot but i i i like oswald chambers um he, there's a devotional my utmost for his high, highest and mm. that was the book that i was reading my devotional for that year and mm. i found that just so so helpful um so not really resources. Obviously, the girls had counselling, and I've had uh, I had some counselling at that point, and I've had some since, mm. um, which has obviously helped. But yeah, I think primarily it was just that quiet time every day. Yeah. Because the first mm. few months when I got back, I didn't work, and I started work at the end of the year. But um, the girls, when they went back to school, and I would just spend time reading uh, scripture mm. and. Um, and it wasn't all day, you know, maybe half an hour or something. But, yeah, the, as I said, just so many times I would read this thing and I'd think, how does it, how come it's on this date is what, this is what I need, you know? Yeah. And so <laughs> it was just like God was saying, this is what you needed and I mm. planned this whenever that book was written. <laughs> mm. is, is, uh, isn't that amazing, Philip? Like we've talked about this over and over again this season, just that, that quiet time, that time with God, that devotional moments uh, is so important uh, to keep yeah, that. Yeah, mm. um, I think I think that goes to the core of of what we had hoped this podcast would be about: is that people would sit under the overflow of Christ and receive what they need. And yeah. if they sit in that space, He will speak. And he will pour into you exactly what you need for the day, for the moment. But so many of us are rushed, anxious, and we would rather sit in our anxieties than sometimes come to him in prayer. I know that when I feel pressure, it's hard for me to, to actually kneel down and just, just take it before the Lord. Mm. And I'm a pastor and I'm telling you the honest truth. Mm. That's yeah. That's what happens to me. You know, I... I would rather rush off and see about finding the solution on my own than Jesus. This is what I'm going through. Mm. Can I cast this care before you? Can you give me your wisdom? Is there scripture that can console me? And yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that he does is with music, I think sometimes mm. at night, because um, night can be mm. a, a, a hard time. Yep. And mm. uh, I will listen to. Um, Music that re, you know that is really uplifting Speaks music and soul. yeah, and yeah. that mm. I find that really draws me to, to God's presence. Mm. Mm. Well, that's been yeah, fantastic to listen to your story. Thank you so much for sharing with us. It's it's been oh, a blessing. Man. It's powerful. Yeah, Jean, thank you so much. And uh, I I felt teary eyed. I saw the tears on the other end of this call here, and it it was powerful. I know our our viewers, or listeners rather, uh, will be so touched by your story, your authenticity, your vulnerability today. So truly thank you so, so very much and uh, praying for God's greatest blessing continually in your life and your precious girls. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we'll be back in October. Uh, until then, I want to encourage you guys to take some time to check out our reflection guides. On our website, choose to overflow.com. Uh, you can also just 
use them just to take a personal inventory of on how you've been processing love, grace, and forgiveness that God has been offering you, just like Philip was just talking about, spending that time uh, letting Jesus flow into you so that you can let it overflow into others. Uh, I guess the question we're asking is, have you been letting it overflow? If not, what are the little things that may be blocking that? Just ponder on those questions there. And maybe you'll have you'll find you have an experience like Gene where you realize that you've accepted God's gifts intellectually, but maybe not at a heart level yet. Mm. So thanks for joining us this season. We'll be back again in a few weeks' time. Yeah, and I guess today to leave you with a few questions, Carl mentioned one already. If you have not been allowing the overflow to go in your life, What's blocking that? What's causing that? But I have two particular questions from today's episode with Gene. I want you to ponder this notion that many in society, or at least in Christian society, like to share, and that's forgive and forget. Um, Is this something you've been struggling with? Why? And I just want to encourage you to be patient. Gene's story really gave the beautiful realization that the Holy Spirit is doing a, a work in people who have been hurt. And sometimes that takes time and we need to let the Holy Spirit do the work he needs to do in their lives. And there's no timeline in that at times. It took Jean almost four years to get to a place where she finally sensed God's peace fully. Second thing I would just encourage you to ponder is this. Are you looking for how God might be trying to help you see the good in spite of the evil done against you? Or are you simply staring at the pain and the darkness, hoping that will make things better? Mm. Take some time to think through those questions. But as always, we want to leave you with a blessing. And so may the goodness of God flow in your life today. May you sense and know that Jesus is with you in the pain, in the joy, in the hopes, in the unmet expectations, in the trials, in the moments when you want to give up, He is there. And so my prayer for you today is that you would feel His ever-flowing peace, that His grace would be upon you, and that you would know He is the God of the overflow. And he wants to do that for your life. Would you choose the overflow? Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for listening in on our conversation today. If something we said made you think, or maybe you just want to say hello or give some feedback, we'd love to hear from you. You can send us an email at hello at choose to overflow.com. You can find us on Instagram at choose to overflow or check out our website choose to overflow.com where you can find more content including a reflection guide for today's episode to help you take the conversation further. That's choose to overflow.com. We also want to thank the Loma Linda University Church for their support of this project. And if this was helpful to you, please leave us a review, share with a friend or three, and subscribe to stay connected. We'll be releasing new episodes every Monday. Thanks again for listening. We hope you choose to overflow this week. Let's chat again soon.